It's 10 o'clock at night. You just laid down to go to sleep, but you can't get comfortable. In fact, you're very uncomfortable. You've got this kind of gnawing, burning pain right in the middle of your chest. Who are you going to call? Stay tuned. In this episode of the Purple Stethoscope, we'll be talking about primary care. You're listening to the Purple Stethoscope. I am your host, Devin Nixon, family nurse practitioner. None of the information provided in this podcast is intended to nor sufficient to diagnose your personal medical issue, but there is a lot to learn, so let's start the show. Okay, so to be fair, the pain didn't just start. It's been happening intermittently for a couple of weeks. Definitely notice it more when you lay down at night to go to sleep. Now, maybe that's just a time when you're unwinding and you're more attentive to how you feel in your body. Or maybe you're having a heart attack. After all, your uncle died from a heart attack at a young age. Your mom has hypertension. You know, that's a risk factor. But money's already tight. And if you go to the ER, God only knows what that will cost. You'd probably miss work tomorrow. And who can afford to do that? But you have to make a decision. I mean, you got kids. You can't just lay there and die. Okay, maybe you're being overly dramatic. Maybe it was the onions on your dinner. But you don't know. So what do you do? Who do you call? The purpose of having a primary care provider is so that you have someone to call in situations just like these. Your primary care provider is a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, or a naturopath who knows you and can offer reassurance, order tests, or tell you you do need to go to the ER. But you have to have one in order to be able to access one. How does a person go about getting a primary care provider? Well, the first question is, do you have insurance or not? If you have insurance, get out the card, go to the website or call the number on the back of the card and tell them that you need to establish care. Look for primary care providers in your area. Read their bios. Look at where they went to school or what they're excited about. If you don't have insurance, look up community health centers, free clinics, or healthcare fairs in your area. You don't wanna wait until you think you're having a heart attack on a Friday night because then your only choice is the ER. And I'll be the first to tell you, it's not a cheap way to go. In fact, medical bills are one of the leading causes of financial strain for Americans. So if money's already tight, the last thing any of us wants to do is go to the emergency department where you know a Tylenol costs you $500. That said... If you have a family history, it can make it a really difficult choice to make. When you find a primary care provider, one of the things to keep in the forefront of your mind is it has to be somebody that you feel comfortable and safe talking to. If you don't, you're not going to disclose things that could be pretty important in making a diagnosis. You also want to make sure it's somebody who speaks to you in a way that you can understand. Yes, they went to school for many, many years, and I'll be the first to admit that we can easily lose sight of maybe using words that people don't understand or talking too fast or not explaining things well enough. You want somebody who is going to listen to you, to answer your questions, and to make you feel comfortable. Once you find a primary care provider, you want to make an appointment to establish care. Now, if you're having a problem, you can go ahead and tell them you want to establish care and discuss your chest pain or abdominal pain. 
But the first appointment is an appointment where you sit down with that person. They talk to you about your family medical history, your personal past medical history, and things that you might be at risk for. For instance, if you are a woman of childbearing age, they may want to know what you're using for birth control. It's not the person being nosy or anything like that. It's just some medications that they may need to prescribe for a problem down the road may not, um, they might interact with birth control. So they need to know everything that you're taking. That includes vitamins and supplements. Plant medicine is really big right now. Natural medicine, um, different potions and, and treatments and detoxes that you can purchase at all manner of ways from online to, you know, farmers markets or what have you. It's very important that your primary care provider knows everything that you're taking for medicinal purposes, even if it's something you buy over the counter at the store. So they're going to go over your family medical history, your past medical history, and your medications. They're going to want to know about any allergies that you have to foods or medicines. They may want to know about any hospitalizations that you had. You know, it's not actually normal to stay in a hospital overnight. Um, usually if that happens, there is something significant that was going on or had to be ruled out. They're going to want to know about your social history. And what I mean by that is where do you live? Who lives in the house with you? Do you smoke? If so, how much? Do you drink? If so, how much? Again, it can feel like somebody's interrogating you or being mad nosy about personal things. But when you're trying to figure out what somebody's at risk for and what specific diseases and illnesses that you need to prevent. These are things they need to know. When I meet somebody for the first time, I ask them who lives at home with them. Um, I generally, right now, I'm working with an older population, so it's important for me to know if something were to happen, who's going to find them? Who's going to be able to help them? So that's one of the first questions I ask. I also like to know what type of residence they're in. Do you live in a house in a rural area where it's going to take an ambulance 20, 30 minutes to get to you? Or do you live in an apartment on the fifth floor with limited access and a power outage? Do you live in a motor home or are you homeless? These are all things that we need to know as primary care providers so that we're not giving you a plan of care that doesn't make sense for you. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you get a new diagnosis of something like diabetes, and I want you to participate in a really good diabetes education course that requires you to come three days a week, if you have nowhere to get there or you live really far away, it's not a good plan of care. So just keep in mind that when you're being asked all these questions, it's not because they're trying to be nosy. It's not because they're trying to pass judgments on you. It's generally because... We need to know what we're working with so that we can make a plan of care that makes sense. Um, drinking, smoking, illicit drugs, these are all very important things. Now, what do I do with that kind of information? If somebody tells me that they inject heroin or uh, that they smoke crack or cigarettes or drink every single night, all I'm doing with that information is educating them on the risk and making a note that there are certain things that I may want to avoid in a person with these habits or with this lifestyle because our job is to make you better, get you well, keep you well, not hurt you. There are medications that interact with alcohol. There are you know, certain medications that can get your heart rate up and you don't want to be prescribing to somebody who's using a street drug like methamphetamine. So again, these questions aren't to be nosy. It's just so that we can know who we're taking care of. So after going through that history, then um, I want to know about, you know, um, a physical exam. Physical exam is a head-to-toe examination. And if you are somebody who doesn't like somebody in your space, <laughs> we know that right away <laughs> by the way you react when we get in your bubble. 
um, a, a, a visit to established care, um, that healthcare provider may look in your ears or ask you about your herring. They might look in your eyes or ask you about your eyesight. They're probably going to feel your neck, feeling the strength of your carotid pulse or feeling your thyroid to see if they can um, palpate or feel a, a nodule. They're going to listen to your heart and your lungs. They're listening for murmurs. They're listening for rate. They're listening for whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. They're listening for how easily air moves in your lungs, if there's um, consolidation or no air movement in a certain part of your lung. Um, they're going to examine your abdomen. They'll probably feel your liver um, for swelling or enlargement. Um, and also, you know, there's a, there's multiple organs in your stomach, so they may feel your stomach, listen to your stomach. Um the genital exam is kind of not, I don't know, some people include it in their establishing care visits. Um, I usually do something called a review of systems, and that's when we ask you questions about each system. So for a person uh, with regard to their genitalia or their genital exam, I may ask a question like, do you feel like you go to the bathroom all the time? Do you have regular bowel movements? Is it painful to go to the bathroom? Have you noticed any discharge? If all of those questions are negative, if the answers to all those questions are negative, then I may not examine the, um, we call it the GU or the genitourinary system as part of the establishing care visit. And that's my personal preference because that's really personal to get in your very first visit. Um, they may... Um, you know, knock on your back in a way, your low back to see if you have pain with that. Um, and then they might feel pulses, squeezing legs. It's really interesting to me when I'm behind and I'm not explaining things as well. Patients are like, what are you doing? Why are you squeezing my legs? Why are you pressing on the tips of my toes? Um, and for me, I'm looking at circulation. I'm looking at fluid, whether they have extra um, swelling in their legs. But a lot of times people don't, you know, know what we're doing. I think it's perfectly okay to say before an exam begins, I'm a little nervous or I don't know what to expect. So if you can tell me everything that you're doing right before you do it or before you do it or while you're doing it, whatever you're most comfortable with, I would really appreciate it. I'll tell you guys, I have had the same gynecologist um, for... Whew, um, well, my oldest is about to be 21, so over 21 years. And I tell him every time I have to go for a pap, um, which can be for ladies that can be a separate visit, not um, it, it doesn't have to be part of your establishing care visit, although it can be. Um, I tell him, hey, you know, if you don't mind saying everything that you're going to do as you're doing it or what you're doing while you're doing it, I really appreciate it. Um, that's very important if you have a history of trauma, if you've been abused or molested or raped, or even if you think that you've gotten over it, um, don't count on your body to be as cool as you think you are in your mind. There is a certain touch that will take you back to a place that you don't want to go to if you fall in that category. Um, so, you know, I think it's perfectly acceptable. And I think most providers would agree that if you just say what's going to make you more comfortable, we do our absolute best to respect that. And, um, and, and that's that. So it can be uncomfortable, but it, nothing should be painful. Um, if there is pain, definitely let your provider know. Um, and I use the term provider to include doctor, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or naturopath. Anybody who, um, or DO, which are also doctors, doctor of osteopathy. Um, <clears throat> anyone whose primary role is to um, take care of people for people's general health, not a specialist. So cardiology would be a specialist. Um, actually, gynecology is a specialist. Pulmonology is a specialist. Neurology is a specialty. Um, primary care is the people that you go to who refer you out to those people as need be. Okay, so I've covered the history. 
I've covered allergies, medications, family history, um, review of systems, exam. You can expect them to um, want to see you back if a problem was identified. And if a problem wasn't identified, they may say, okay, you can follow up as needed or follow up in a year. Um, it's highly recommended to follow up at least once a year. So if you're 22, you're healthy, you take no meds, you have no allergies, you're just there to establish care because you heard this lady on her podcast telling you it's something you should do, you may not need to be seen for another year. <clears throat> um, but that doesn't mean you have to wait until your appointment to get help for something. You can always call. You can always leave a message with the team. You know, most of these um, providers have a medical assistant or a receptionist or a nurse where you can leave them a message. A lot of places have um, patient portals where you can send a little email through an app on your phone or um, through the uh, company's website. Um, so I, I definitely want to leave you with that. Another thing that I did not mention that I want to mention because this is a hot topic um, is immunizations. If you're going to establish care and you either don't have your immunization record, don't know your immunization record, they may recommend something from a flu shot to a tetanus shot to a pneumonia shot depending on your age and your presentation. And so that is something else that you may expect in an established care, an establishing care visit. I'm not going to go into um, any debates or opinions on immunizations. That's between you and your provider. Um, but you can expect to be asked if you want to get your flu shot today or want to get your shingles vaccination today. So you can expect that in your visit, too. Uh, when it comes to paying for these visits, if you have insurance, you're probably going to have something called a copay. Um, I think my copay, you know what? It's gone up again. Um, it's gone up again. It's now $30. So when I go and I check in, they ask me, do you want to pay your copay today or do you want us to bill it to you? Um, so if you're able to pay it that day, you can do that. Otherwise, uh, a lot of places will bill you. If it's a private pay situation, that's typically something that will be looked into prior to your visit. So you want to ask if they have a sliding scale or income-based um, billing. And there's probably some extra paperwork to fill out with regards to that. If you find somebody you like and you're interested in seeing, call the clinic before your appointment and tell them, hey, I don't have insurance or this is my insurance. What can I expect to pay? Um, a lot of times they don't, they can't give you an exact answer because they don't know what's going to come out in your visit, right? So example, if a 27 year old woman who's not on birth control comes into me with symptoms for, of a sinus infection and they've been going on for several weeks and it's just not getting better and I want to prescribe antibiotics, I need to know if that young lady is pregnant before I can prescribe her any antibiotics. So, um, she may have to go pee in a in a um, specimen cup in the bathroom. And that's, again, this is one of the things we don't explain much. I've had patients be like, yeah, and I think they judged me and tested me for drugs. You know, ask, speak up, use your voice and say, hey, um, what is this for again? Um, and they should be pretty open about telling you what it's for. But whoever you talk to in the reception before your visit is not going to be able to include the cost of that test at the time of visit. So that's something to keep in mind. They can only give you ballparks if that. Um, and uh, don't let the cost prevent you from establishing primary care. Um, that is one appointment that you absolutely want to make to go to and to pay for, even if you have to get on a payment plan and be very vocal with your provider that, hey, I don't have insurance or I have high deductible insurance, which is when your insurance doesn't kick in until you pay, you know, a certain number of dollars out of your own pocket. You want to tell them that so that they can keep that in mind when they are ordering tests or prescribing medications. Um, so that is the introduction to primary care. Getting back to the scenario that we started with, 
if that person did not have a primary care provider and they had that chest pain, um, laying down, not able to get comfortable, so they decided to present to the emergency department, I can tell you they're going to have an electrocardiogram to look at the electricity in their heart. They're probably going to have a chest x-ray to look at the size of their heart, see if there's fluid on their heart, etc. They may even end up getting a blood test to make sure they don't have a blood clot or a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in the lung. Um, they're probably going to be given medications that we call a GI cocktail, which just includes some stuff to rule out a cardiac cause. So basically, if they give you this mixture of medications to drink, it's like, let's just say the hospital equivalent to Maalox and your symptoms go away, then they're like, oh, this is more likely to be a gastrointestinal um, cause rather than a cardiac cause. And I can tell you the bill for that is going to be astronomical. Um, and I don't want to deter anyone from going to the ER if they think they're having a heart attack because that's the place you want to go. That said, <clears throat> If you have a primary care provider, and this is something that's been going on for weeks, and you, you could call them before it gets bad. You can go in and have a visit with them. You tell them you have a stressful job. You um, sit a lot at work and you have some low back pain, so you're taking Motrin every day. You come home and have you know a couple beers or a couple of glasses of wine and then you go and you lay down to go to bed and you're having this kind of burning pain guess what you're probably going to walk away with a diagnosis of gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD and you're probably going to be given some lifestyle modifications like cut back on alcohol um Let's find an alternative to the, to Motrin because that can be upsetting to your stomach. Let's eat a couple of hours before bedtime, not eating really close to lying down. They're, they may prescribe a medication to help with those symptoms, and it's going to cost you a fraction of what it will cost to pull up in an emergency department. Again, I don't want to ever deter anyone come from coming to the ER if they think they're having a heart attack. Um, but your primary care provider can also educate you on symptoms of a heart attack versus um, symptoms uh, that are typically non-cardiac pain. All right, you guys, I've been talking for a really long time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Purple Stethoscope. I have to tell you that these doctor's offices do not run on CP time. They don't run on African time. They don't run on island time, whatever time you like to call it. And this honestly, in my life, even though I've been in the medical field for over 20 years, the hardest thing for me to do is to get my behind to an appointment in time to check in. Um, there are a lot of providers who are under tremendous pressure to see as many patients as possible. And if you show up late and you're going to get them off schedule and have people leaving, they reserve the right to say, sorry, I can't see you today um, and have you reschedule. So another question you might ask the front desk when you're establishing or if you're calling ahead is what is your cancellation policy? Because oftentimes late cancellations will still be charged a partial fee. So I want to be very upfront with letting you know, you know, um, the medical system, I'm going to shock no one when I say this, is not set up um culturally with our cultural view of time so if they say your appointment time is eight be there at 7 40 ask what is my check-in time and that way you know exactly what time you're expected to be there okay thanks so much for listening you guys i hope this helps somebody take care talk to you later Thanks so much for tuning in to The Purple Stethoscope. I'm your host, Devin Nixon, family nurse practitioner. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at D, the NP. That's at symbol D, like Devin, the NP, like nurse practitioner. If you like what you've heard today, go ahead and share the episode, or even better yet, rate and review. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.